Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. We're gonna do a mini PC review for you here today. Now I've done a bunch of these. In fact, I have an entire spreadsheet where I've gone over every single mini PC I've ever tested and what kind of performance you can expect. And I usually put these into one of three categories. We have like our budget ones, then the mid tier, and then our full on desktop replacements at that higher level. This one that we're reviewing today is one of the affordable options. This one's called the UM450 from Mini's Forum. As you will see, this one has a shell very similar to other Mini's Forum PCs. And so we kind of already know what we're gonna be getting as far as the hardware specs. What it really comes down to is the performance. Now, if you were to look on like AliExpress, you can find cheaper mini PCs out in the market. For example, you can get something for like $150. This one starts at about $200 bare bones, about $300 if you add the hard drive and RAM. And so it's not the absolute cheapest out there, but what I'm hoping to find here is that it's a good balance between the price and the performance. This one has a Ryzen 5 4500U inside of it, which is gonna give you six cores and six threads. So I'm hoping that'll give us performance at least up to like generation six when it comes to emulation. Either way, we'll do all my favorite stuff here when we talk about PC game testing and see how far we can push it, but then also retro game emulation, both on Windows and Linux. And so without any further delay, let's dive in. Okay, let's start with pricing and specs. Number one, you have three different processors to choose from, and I've already tested the other two models in previous videos. The one we're gonna be reviewing here is the low-end model, $220 for the bare bones version. But if you'd like to have them add 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage, it'll come up to $309 before shipping. Now, in terms of specs, I'm gonna break a lot of this down when I actually go over the device itself, but I did wanna show you the listing right here. Of note, we have two different types of storage that we can use, and it can give video out capability to three different monitors at once, all at 4K 60 Hertz. As for the rest, we'll go over that here in a second. Now, as always, this was a review unit sent over from Mini's forum, and it's been preloaded with 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage. And all opinions are my own. They're not seeing this video ahead of time and no money was exchanged in any way. Inside the box, we have a quick start guide and then underneath the PC itself, we've got a bunch of goodies. This includes a stand if you want to have the computer set vertically, and it comes with a pretty big power supply, which is rated for 65 watts and has a barrel plug. We also have an HDMI cable as well as a SATA adapter, which we'll use here later. And then also two additional rubber feet in case you need to get into the computer itself. And then finally, we have a Visa mount, the mounting screws, as well as some hard drive screws as well. Now, pulling out the PC itself, it's going to be of no surprise if you've watched any of my other similar videos. This is the exact same design we've been seeing for about six months to a year at this point. Up front, we have a CMOS reset button, then the power button itself then a headphone microphone jack, and then two USB-C ports. And the one on the right is capable of video out. On the sides, we just have a little bit of ventilation here on the top. And so let's take a look at the back. We have that barrel plug for the power supply here on the left, then 2.5 gigabit ethernet, and then two USB-A 3.2 Gen 2 ports dual HDMI, and then two more USB 3.2 ports. And really, that's about it. It's a pretty simple design overall. On the bottom, you can see the two screw holes for the Visa mount, and the screws to get inside the computer itself are hidden by these rubber feet. And unfortunately, there's no elegant way to remove these. You basically just have to rip them off. And again, this is why they pack in those additional rubber feet in case these lose their stickiness over time. Either way, to get inside, it's very simple. There's just four small Phillips head screws, and there's a little divot on one of these sides. You just use a plastic spudger to open this right up. And so while we're in here, let's go ahead and take a look at the components. Starting with the RAM, you can see the brand name right here. And we have two sockets right here, and the RAM that came with it is DDR4 with a 3200 megahertz speed. And it looks like we have a Fison M.2 2280 drive right here, 512 gigs. And underneath that drive, we have an M.2 Wi-Fi chip. And this is a very common chip right here, rated for Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.0. Now let's talk a little bit about the SATA adapter that comes with the PC. And this is a very simple setup process. You just wanna plug this into the SATA port that we have right here. And it does take a little bit of finesse to get it in. After that, all you're gonna need is a two and a half inch drive with a SATA port. This one here is a one terabyte solid state drive. They're usually about 50 bucks altogether. And this one I've already preloaded with Botticera and a bunch of my games. So all I'm gonna do is just plug this in right here. And then the bottom lid of the PC itself has these little connectors right here to slide the drive in. So on one side, they're gonna hook in like this. And then on the other side, we're gonna screw in the hard drive using two screws that come with the Visa mount in that bag. And that's really about it. That's how you would expand these storage here on this mini PC. So let's jump over to software testing, but before we do that, let's do a quick size comparison. We're actually out of Kerrygold butter here at the house, and so instead, we're gonna compare it against a pound of frozen peas. 
And as you can see right here, yeah, it's quite a bit smaller than this bag. For a more practical comparison, here it is against an Xbox Series controller. As you can see, this PC is quite small. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the initial boot and setup of this device. After all, it is a Windows machine. And just to confirm with the settings here, yes, we have the Ryzen 5 4500U with 16 gigs of RAM installed as well as Windows 11 Pro. If you want some more details, here's the hardware info screen right here. The biggest takeaway for me right here is that the TDP is set to 15 watts. And the RAM is clocked at 3200 megahertz. Now, two things I like to test before getting into game testing are going to be the thermal profile and then also how loud the fan gets. So looking here running Cinebench, you can see that initially it actually runs at a 25 watt TDP and the temperature remains relatively low, somewhere between 75 and 80 degrees Celsius were the max that I found. However, I did find that after about three or four minutes of testing, it would drop back down to 15 watts. And at that thermal profile, we're looking at a much lower temperature, about 65 degrees max. What this says to me is that if you do want to increase the overall TDP, you might be able to get away with it without maxing out the temperature too high. Either way, for my testing here, we are going to keep it at the default 15 watt TDP profile. Now, when it comes to fan noise, I basically didn't hear anything. In fact, even at max speed, I could barely hear it. Here's a quick audio test, and I'm also going to click on my mouse so you can get a feel for the ambient noise. And yes, this is actually a very quiet clicking mouse and you can hear it's way louder than the fan itself. For those of you who are following the numbers, you can see the Cinebench score here is not super high. We're looking at a little bit over 5,000 points. But of course, the name of this channel is not Retro Benchmark Core. So let's get into some game testing here and see what kind of performance we can actually get. We're going to start with PC games and we're going to go with lightweight and then move our way up from there. In general, I try to play everything at 1080p and with 60 frames per second if the game supports it. And generally, I will try to use either the default settings with these indie games or the highest settings that they have available. But in general, as you can see here, when it comes to these lightweight PC games, basically any of these 2D games, absolutely no problem here. Each of these would play at 60 frames per second without missing a beat. And with some games like Hades, if I turned off VSync, you could see I'm getting about average of 120 frames per second here. Now, of course, bear in mind that the video output of this PC only rates at 60 Hz, so you're not going to get any faster speeds than that. This is really just a demonstration of the processing power that we have here to work with. Either way, yes, for many 2D and even isometric games, you should have no problem playing them here on this PC. I even found that some 3D games, for example, Nino Kuni right here, as well as even Tomb Raider, played pretty well at 1080p with 60 frames per second. Now, for Tomb Raider, I did have to drop down the settings to low, but even then, 1080p at low looks very good. However, once you start moving past that, that's when you're going to start running into issues. For example, with Risk of Rain 2 right here, I could not get 60 frames per second with 1080p. So you have one of two options right here. You can either reduce the frame rate to something like 40 frames per second, or you can drop the resolution down to 720p. And for some games, that's going to be a necessity. For example, with Bioshock Infinite, I could only play this at 720p medium settings to get 60 frames per second. And it's a similar story with Grand Theft Auto 5. Here I am with 720p under their normal settings, which is kind of their lowest setting possible. But as you can see with VSync turned off, we're getting over 60 frames per second. So this will play comfortably with these settings. It's just a matter of whether or not these graphics are going to be good enough for you. Moving over to competitive shooters, here's Counter-Strike Go. I'm running this at 1080p with low settings and I'm getting an average of about 70 frames per second. So again, with 60 frames per second, you should have a pretty stable experience. But I'm not really sure how competitive you want to be if you're only getting 60 frames per second. And some games will not get to 60 frames per second even at 720p. Resident Evil 3 is a great example right here. For this one, I turned FSR off because I just think it looks a little bit janky. But the only way I could get a stable frame rate was with 30 frames per second. And honestly, I don't think this looks terrible. In fact, it's a pretty good gameplay experience on a TV. But all the same, I don't think it's going to blow you away. Now, playing other games with these similar settings, it may not look as good. For example, here's Final Fantasy VII Remake, and yes, this is running at 720p low settings with a 30 frames per second cap. And to me, honestly, this just looks too muddy to actually enjoy. One of the big things for me with Final Fantasy VII Remake is I love how beautiful it looks. And so personally, while I do find this to be playable, I don't think I'd actually enjoy it here on this PC. No good? Needs power, I think. And really, this is probably the limit of the UM450 when it comes to PC gaming. If we try something a little bit more intense, like Horizon Zero Dawn, you can see at 720p with low settings, it actually struggles to maintain 30 frames per second. And you can definitely feel a little bit of slowdown when it dips below that point. Now, within the settings, you do have the ability to turn on upscaling with FSR. 
and turning this on will improve the performance to the point where you can get 30 frames per second, no problem. However, it takes a pretty big dip when it comes to graphical fidelity. At this point, it almost feels like playing an Xbox 360 game. So yes, I would say that Horizon Zero Dawn is playable, and same thing with other games like Marvel Spider-Man. However, you are going to have to make some compromises here. It's going to have a lower resolution, and you're only going to be able to run it at 30 frames per second. And by turning on FSR, it's going to make it look pretty muddy. And it'll be even more apparent if you try to play these games on a larger TV. So for me, these settings are just fine when it comes to playing on a handheld, but for a mini PC like this, you may not have a great time. So that's my quick recap when it comes to PC gaming performance. Overall, I'm pretty impressed that you can play many, many games, but depending on how advanced that game is, you may get to a point where the juice just isn't worth the squeeze. Next, let's try out some emulation. We're going to start with GameCube and work our way up from there. Now, like I mentioned in the intro, my main hope here was to get at least Generation 6 gameplay. That's going to be GameCube and PS2. And honestly, I think this thing knocks it out of the park. Not only can it play all those games, but you can play them upscaled at a 1080p or 3x resolution. And, no matter what GameCube game I threw at it, all the way up to F-Zero GX, we're playing at full speed with absolutely no problems here. And I think that makes sense, because at a $300 price point, you should definitely be able to play GameCube and PS2. But of course, we're not going to stop there, so let's go ahead and start moving things up, sticking with Nintendo systems. To start, we have Nintendo Wii. This one can also play at 3x resolution for most games. With Tatsunoko vs Capcom, I did get a little bit of slowdown when doing a special move, but this is a very common thing with this game. I would say that for some games you may have to downgrade the resolution down to maybe 720p, but either way I would say Nintendo Wii is completely playable here too. Let's move over to Sony for a second, here is PlayStation 2 gameplay. Again, with a 1080p resolution we're getting some really good performance. Even some of these harder to play games like Ratchet & Clank Going Commando or even Black can still play at full speed at 1080p. I did get a dip every once in a while with some of these games, so it does look like PS2 is a little bit harder to emulate on this system than GameCube, but all the same, I am very comfortable in saying that this is capable of playing those two systems no problem. So let's go ahead and jump up another generation to Nintendo Wii U. For this one, I played everything at the native resolution, which is going to be 720p for most games, but it may be 1080p for others, like Legends of Zelda Wind Waker. Either way, with each of these games, I found that they ran at full speed with no problem. In fact, even when they were compiling new shader pipelines, I still was getting full speed most of the time. And so to me, that's a great indication that you'll be able to play most of the Nintendo Wii U catalog with absolutely no issues here. Now, the ultimate benchmark for this system in particular is going to be Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. And for this one, I kept it at the native 720p resolution and then also gave it a 30 frames per second cap. So essentially, this runs about as well as it does natively on a Nintendo Wii U. And I would get some dips below the 30 frames per second, especially when compiling new shaders. And this is even with asynchronous shaders turned on. But still, when that was not happening, I was getting full speed gameplay. So this is one of those cases where the longer you play the game, the better the performance is going to get. Either way, I think this really seals the deal that Wii U emulation is absolutely possible on this $300 PC. Sticking with Nintendo, let's move over to some of the harder to emulate systems. Next up is going to be Nintendo 3DS. This one I'm running at a 2x resolution, and I am getting some dips here and there with some of the harder to run games like New Super Mario 3D Land. But with most other games, including Mario Kart 7, it seemed to play at full speed no problem. I don't think you're going to be able to play it at a 3x resolution, but most games I think will play at 2x, and then for those that have issues, you can drop them down to the native resolution. It's definitely not going to look great on a big screen TV, but if you really want to play Nintendo 3DS without having a Nintendo 3DS, this is how you could do it. And finally, we'll move over to Nintendo Switch. Now, initially, I played this in the default docked mode here with the Yuzu emulator, and as you can see, it's struggling to reach 60 frames per second. However, if you switch it over to handheld mode, things get a lot easier. And so here with Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, you can see that in handheld mode, it is running at full speed. The graphics aren't quite as good. I think this is running in 720p right here. But all the same, I found that most Nintendo Switch games I tried played well at 60 frames per second within handheld mode. Even some of those harder to play games like Link's Awakening were doing pretty good. Now when moving into a new area, you're probably going to see some slowdown when the new shaders compile. But again, like with the Wii U, the longer you play the game, the better it's going to work. But unfortunately, I think that's about the limit when it comes to emulation here on Windows. If we move over to PS3 emulation, you can see that even the easiest to play games like Dead or Alive 5 are struggling to maintain 60 frames per second. Now this emulator in particular likes to have lots of cores and threads, so I think we're being held back by the 6 cores and 6 threads right here. Either way, playing the lightweight games like Demon's Souls or God of War 2 HD, I still was not getting a full frame rate. So I would say unless you want to play like PSN titles, then you're probably not going to have a good time here with the PS3 emulator. 
But of course, bear in mind, we're talking about a PC here that costs $300. A couple years ago, a $300 PC would have struggled to play GameCube and PS2. And unfortunately, when it comes to Xbox 360, it's going to be a similar story. Even the easier to play games like Vanquish are just struggling to even get close to 30 frames per second. And it's going to be a similar story with some of the harder to play games like Crackdown. So in general, I would say do not buy this machine if you're looking for PS3 and Xbox 360 emulation. You're likely going to have to shell out quite a bit more money for those too. Okay, so that's a quick summary of our Windows emulation. Now let's move over to Botticera. If you remember, we installed that hard drive earlier in the video. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to boot into my recovery options. And then within here under advanced startup, I'm going to select restart now. That's going to bring you to these recovery options right here. And we're going to go into use a device. And then we're going to select the Eufy OS. This is going to boot from that other hard drive. Now, of course, I've already installed Botticera, so it's just going to run that image. And you don't actually have to use a hard drive for this. If you have a flash drive, you can load it onto there. In fact, I've made videos about this concept. I'll leave one link below. Either way, once we're inside, we now have have a fully functioning retro gaming system that'll work all the way up through Nintendo Wii U. To me personally, I think this is going to be a great solution if you want to use this mini PC as a dedicated gaming device. For example, you can jump into your favorite retro games, and of course these are going to play absolutely no problem. So if you want to turn this into like a 16-bit era machine or maybe an arcade cabinet, this could totally work. And of course, you can always push it up a little bit. So for example, with Sega Saturn, we can play with the Beetle Core, which is going to be very accurate. And it's still going to run really well, even with the hardest to play games like Sega Rally Championship. Moving over to PS2, I found that most games did play at 3x resolution here as well, but some like God of War, I did have to drop down to 2x. Either way, even at this resolution, it's running great. And the nice thing here is that Xbox emulation works really well on Linux firmwares like Botticera. And so here I'm running Dead or Alive 3 and Grand Theft Auto 3 at a 2x resolution and they're playing at full speed. So if you want to play a bunch of original Xbox games, I would recommend doing it here on Botticera. In the end, I think this is probably one of the best use cases for the UM450. Let me show you a quick portable setup that I made right here. I've gone into the BIOS and I've set it so that the Botticera hard drive boots before Windows. And then I'm using that USB-C out port to give video and power out to my portable monitor right here. From there, I'm using an 8-bit DO Ultimate controller, the 2.4 GHz version. So in the back here, I have a wireless dongle hooked up, which will connect directly to Botticera. With all this set in place, all I have to do is just press on the power button. It's going to boot from that SATA hard drive directly into Botticera. And just like that, we're off to the races with my own portable retro gaming machine. Now I have everything blown up to the native 3x2 aspect ratio here on the monitor. And that's going to look really great with 4x3 content, especially if you keep it at the native resolution. So for example, something like Sega Saturn with its native resolution in the Beetle Core. This I'm going to keep at a 3x2 and yeah, it looks great. But the system that's probably going to look the best is going to be Game Boy Advance because this natively ran at a 3x2 aspect ratio. Here I'm blowing it up to full screen and yeah, it looks great. Now, when moving over to something like Nintendo GameCube and PS2, I found that because I'm using an upscale, I kind of don't mind actually blowing this up to be a full 3x2. Of course, it is stretching it out a little bit from the original 4x3, and so yes, your characters might look a little bit more stretched and wide, but all the same, I think it looks really good right here. And of course, you could also use widescreen hacks if you wanted as well. Either way, it's pretty neat to have a portable GameCube and PS2 system like that. And I'm happy to report that the Wii U emulation on this is just as good as it is on Windows too. So if you wanted to cap out at Wii U emulation here on this mini PC running Botticera, you could totally do that too. In the end, I think this is a pretty great solution. For example, if you wanted to hook this up to your living room TV, you could have a full retro gaming system set up like this on your big TV for about $300 altogether. And of course, you could always boot back into Windows if you wanted to do some PC gaming as well. Okay, so in wrapping things up right here, let's go ahead and talk about what I like and what I don't like about the UM450. Starting with what I like, number one is going to be this compact size. We've seen this mini PC shell in multiple iterations, and honestly, I think it's a really great move. Given that it has a small size like this, you can hook it up to like the back of a monitor or have it discreetly on your desk or in front of your living room TV, and they're all going to fit. I also appreciate the quiet fan, which can be quite distracting on other mini PCs. Here, I basically never even noticed it the entire time I was doing all of my testing, and I really pushed this device to its limits while doing that. I was also really impressed by the performance for that $300 price tag. Yes, it's not going to be able to play every single PC game at full speed, but it will play a lot of games even nestling up to that AAA tier. It really will come down to what kind of compromises you need to make when it comes to frame rate or graphical fidelity. And of course, when it comes to emulation, I was really impressed too. I was surprised to find that Wii U worked really well, but even Nintendo Switch in handheld mode was actually pretty good as well. 
And I think that amount of functionality for this price is a pretty good deal. But of course, it's not perfect. And so let's talk a little bit about some of the things I didn't like about the UM450. Number one was the placement of some of these ports. I appreciate that there's a USB-C port on the front, but it doesn't make sense to me to have both of them on the front when you could have put one on the back especially when it comes to the one that's video out capable. It just seems a little bit strange to have your video port here on the front. Additionally, I would have appreciated having a USB-A port on the front too. For example, that would make it pretty easy to plug in a wired controller. Now, I wasn't expecting much, but I was a little bit disappointed that we didn't get really any good PS3 or Xbox 360 emulation out of this PC. I think that in the years to come, we will see that at the $300 price point, but at least for now, I'm not seeing it here. And finally, the other takeaway that I have here, and this really isn't a dig at the UM450, but we have a lot of other options out there available. In fact, in the period that I had for testing with this mini PC, Minis Forum actually announced another release with the same shell. And this one's called the UM560 XT, and it's running the Ryzen 5 5600H CPU. And if you look at benchmark sites, you can see this is actually a little bit better chip than the one we're testing here today. It's about a year newer, but then also can run with 6 cores and 12 threads. And in addition, the TDP is configurable up to 54 watts. Now this one isn't shipping until next month, but the pre-sale price right now is actually $299. And so if you're willing to wait a month for this one to deliver, you're going to get more bang for your buck here with this one instead. Now that isn't to say that the UM450 isn't a bad deal, because I think it is. It's really just a good demonstration of how this market moves so fast, and so it's always going to be in your best interest to wait for the next big thing. And so in the end, you might be wondering, is the UM450 worth that $309 price point right now? And I would say, given the performance and the features that we have here, that yes, I think it is worth it. But at the same time, I think any time that you are investing more than like $250 in a product, you really have to do your research too. And along those same lines, I did a little bit of research myself. To start, I looked at the 4500U chipset, which is made for a laptop. And so, of course, naturally, I looked at other laptops that have that same CPU. And from a price perspective, I didn't really find any that were under about $499. And so in comparison between the two, yes, the UM450 is quite a bit less expensive, but of course the laptop has other perks like the battery and screen and keyboard, things like that. Either way, when compared to a laptop, I think that the UM450 is competitively priced. Now, another thing that a lot of people like to bring up is that you could build your own PC for cheaper. And in many respects, yes, I agree. For example, you could buy a used Dell Office desktop and you could get these for like under $100. From there, you could upgrade your RAM and then also install a low profile graphics card. And with that kind of setup, you can generally get better PC gaming performance than what we saw right here. But of course, bear in mind that many of these Dell desktops have been used a lot over the years. And so they may not have a very long lifespan with some of their other components. Now, of course, you could also build one from scratch. You won't be able to make something so small, but if you wanted to make like a micro ATX build, you could definitely do that on a budget. So I went over to PC Part Picker and I tried to build the cheapest PC that I could using available parts. So this is a different style computer. It's going to be a desktop class CPU. And the 4600G is actually a little bit more powerful than the one we have in the UM450. Either way, when you put all this together, including the CPU and the motherboard, the RAM and the hard drive, not to mention the power supply, the Wi-Fi adapter, and then the case itself, we're looking at about $350 altogether for these new components. Also bear in mind, you'll have to buy a Windows license for the PC as well. And so you are looking at something that's quite a bit larger than the UM450 and a little bit more expensive as well. However, with a setup like this, you could then buy a discrete graphics card later down the line and get a lot bigger boost in performance. Meanwhile, a mini PC like the UM450, basically what you buy is what you're going to get. However, at the same time, you're getting a lot of great things with the UM450. We're getting something that's already been fully built and under warranty, and we have a much smaller form factor. Here's a look at my own micro ATX build compared to the UM450, and you can see it is a night and day difference. In the end, if you're looking for a very small pre-built mini PC and you have a budget of about $300, I do think that the UM450 is a pretty solid deal. Not only can you play a good amount of PC games available today, you can also emulate all the way up to Nintendo Wii U and even some Nintendo Switch with some pretty impressive performance. So let me know what you think in the comments below. At $300, is this good bang for your buck? Or do you think it's worth saving up a little bit more and getting something at a higher tier? As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.